Shalom. Welcome back to Code Searcher. All right. Earlier today, I did a video talking about the Bible Code Bombshell, as you can see there. Um, I told you we would either do a live stream from YouTube or just a YouTube video. And it was possibly tonight. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a few days to get this you know, video circulated a little bit so that kind of word gets out. Because when I put something out about me doing something and then jump right into it there's several of you that kind of get upset that I didn't put out enough notice I think the same thing happened um, when I went to California um, I didn't give you guys enough notice so it, was, it wasn't as expected uh, so we're going to change that uh, we'll be reading from this book and doing a study I believe Sunday would be a good day you could, uh, at least a day to uh, prepare, make arrangements uh, to, to, to watch. But tonight, I'm going to read, since it's already 10.14. Time got away from me. I've been doing a little bit of painting uh, down here. So we're going to read the introduction to this book. Um, and we'll go from there. So, let's get started. Radio astronomers have scanned the heavens for decades for evidence of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. They've been looking for non-random patterns of sound, music, speech, or rather just plain noise. Thus far, they have failed to experience any even close to what Jodie Foster did in the movie Contact. But now there's a convincing evidence that some kind of ex exceptionally non-random extraterrestrial communication with earthlings occurred during the writings of the Hebrew Bible. And this is tongue in cheek, folks. This is not serious. He's getting to a point. Not just the importance of his magnificent surface text, but also in the presence of improbable, extensive codes embedded beneath the text. What is intriguing is that this should have this should be true for a text through various translations, has sold over six billion copies worldwide, according to some estimates. Who wrote the Bible? What is this series of desert, uh, desert mystics who conjured up the concept of, of God to deliver, uh, to, to help them cope with life in a savage world? Or as it the result of a faithful recording of words of God revealed to two scribes or prophets over many centuries, could it be a mixture of these? For the last two centuries, if not longer, academics have launched a concrete assault on the Bible, seeking to cut down the realm of man pen books. By and large, they have succeeded, or so they thought. Now, the the comment he made there about extraterrestrials was a, was a jab at Michael Drazen, who came up with the conclusion by the end of his third book that aliens. And this is an uh, this is an atheist agnostic who wrote this book, and it says, Aliens put codes in the Bible so that we can change the future. Just totally preposterous. In 1994, three Israeli scientists introduced Bible codes to the world with an ep uh, academic paper that startled with mathematically savvy. The paper claimed that the names of the most famous Jewish rabbis and dates of their birth or death were encoded in the book of Genesis, much closer to one another than could be explained by chance. Had the book of Genesis been written by an author who had knew, known the future way before any of these rabbis lived? Ever since the publication of that paper, Bible codes have been uh, uh, under visceral attack. We have witnessed a series of unprofessional displays by reputable scientists who forcefully assert half-truths to shoot down straw men of their devising. All claims of valid Bible codes, past or future, must be false. They boldly proclaim, proclaim as if they had any clue as to what evidence might surface in the future. Their attempts to discredit Bible codes have been, have, at the savor of desperation about them. Why would that be? Could it be for motivations similar to those who drove Herod to order the Christ child murdered in his manger? To those that force prayer out of public schools, for whatever their reasons, code skeptics 
have been fairly successful in turning much of the public against the concept. When I first began investigating claims about Bible codes five years ago, it was thir- it, I was thoroughly skeptical, and I was out work too. That's how I got in. I was skeptical. I didn't believe it was there. It took a, uh, it took some revelation, and some and some getting into it before I got it. Nevertheless, the possibility of their potential validity so fascinated me that I couldn't walk away from investigating them thoroughly. And the intellectual challenge of de- uh, uh, deriving the math to test the published claims was irresistible, and I know what he means. To some who love solving problems, for some pro- uh, protagonists in the fray of over Bible codes, their own personal opposition to religion evidently motivates them to set aside object- objectivity and ethics in their efforts to discredit code proponents. And what he means by that is that Brendan Mc, uh, Brandon McKay, I told you about earlier, actually uh, forged codes that he said he got from Gone to Win and War and Peace and presented them as uh, valid codes. And when his codes could not be reproduced, and if I have a program and you have a program, if I present a table that's a supposedly in there, you should be able to produce the same one with your program. They're they're universal. So the fact that Brendan McKay would not present evidence that could be validated through other researchers screams fraud. And this is what we're talking about here. To discredit code proponents, my own religious belief did not cause me to favor nor doubt the purported reality of Bible codes. I have been a Christian for over 30 years, uh, during which time I've also been practicing mathematician who has enjoyed a very successful career, serving as a managing principal with a leading international accounting and consulting firm as a president of my own thriving consulting practice, and have also uh, served in some of the most familiar names in American business and government. I've never needed codes as proof for my beliefs. These were forged 25 years ago, and I can concur, before I had ever heard about a code. So, from that perspective, whether codes are bunk or real has never made any difference to me. I will confess that in the last few years, I have been partially motivated by my reactions to thinly veiled efforts by non-religious scientists to cut down any efforts to present scientific evidence in the support of faith. Let the truth be known, not suppressed. I can be passionate about that. As a researcher, team, as a research team has explored in Hebrew, we have been repeatedly blown away by the truth, astonishingly, uh, astonishing from phenomenon we have found within uh, its letters. We have tried to maintain a scientific cool as we communicate these findings on our website and in a monthly e-newsletter that we've published since 1999. We have been inundated with code fines and often wish for the funding to retain a couple of dozen qualified researchers to pursue the leads that we have found. A number of times in, uh, in computing the probability that a given coder clus- code cluster could be due to chance, we've reached uh, the point where our Microsoft Excel spreadsheets could go no further. The odds were too overwhelmingly small that we would find. Uh, excuse me. The odds were too overwhelmingly small. The things we found could not be the product of chance. They have to have been placed there purposely. Furthermore, it would be impossible for human beings to have the, been the originators of it, even using all the Cray supercomputers ever built linked together. There is only one intelligence capable of such a feat, and he is commonly referred to as you. A few free spirits will argue that intensely advanced aliens, and this is Drosden, wrote the Bible. If that were so, why would the literal text itself contain focus on you dealing with human affairs? There is an axiom in logic called Akram's razor. It states that when there is 
two competing hypotheses that could explain something. The simplest and most straightforward should be the one chosen. The God hypothesis is clear choice. When the advocates of alien authorship can come up with some objective way to differentiate alien from divine doings, then the question of authorship might be reopened. Until then, who wins? I, for one, think that if aliens wrote the Bible, codes would largely be bizarre. To the contrary, codes echo the content of the literal text, seeming to infirm that. And that's what I've said before. What you have on the surface text will be proven itself in coded text. In coded. For instance, Isaiah 53, and we're going to cover that. You're going to see some amazing tables of Isaiah 53. Like I said before, there's over 1,600 uh, terms in there, access terms. And the probability of that is so out of this world, you are more likely to win the Powerball and what just had go on 100 times in a row. That's how likely. That's crazy. The book presents sub bombshells, the media, uh, the mega clusters of Isaiah 53 and Ezekiel 37, in support of the main thesis. Each of these sufficient to be to devastate the efforts of code skeptics who have been advancing half truths in the hope of quelling public interest in the Bible codes. And you've seen it firsthand, folks. I'm telling you, you've seen it firsthand. When Michael draws in the author of the bestseller, Bible Code, set forth his trivial answers, it was easy for skeptics to derive comparable examples of non-inspired texts. These skeptics are too smart to think they can derive examples from, excuse me, from inspired texts that they might even begin to compare with the mega clusters from the Bible presented in this book. So they will likely pursue others to other tactics. These skeptics will not welcome new evidence that supports the reality of Bible codes, nor will they appreciate the book that exposes their half-truths for what they are. This, there is a juggernaut of inertia set against new ideas that challenge the ruling paradigm. Science cannot validate any form of religion, so the dogma of the paradigm dictates. Will a few brave academics risk their careers to support the validity of recent code claims? Will any scientific journal risk its reputation by publishing research papers supporting codes? In the meanwhile, this book has rolled off the press, and the BibleCodeDigest.com website continues to receive and growing waves of this of hits. As much as uh, we've discovered in the five short years, we have uh, we have the strong sense that we are the only we are only starting to skim the surface of what lies beneath the literal text. We are about the business of advancing the human knowledge of this incredible field. We wish we could also, we wish we could also say that our, that about our antagonists. To the general reader, following the controversy, making sense of Bible codes is like trying to jump waves of a heavy surf froth with riptides, a heavy duty blindfold and earplugs. The skeptics made these knowledge blockers by trying to get us to believe a lie, that all code examples are comparable in the sense that they could be easily product of chance. The half-truth is, some published examples are just as they say. The whole truth is, other examples are so impossible, they have to be intentional. We have tools to gauge the difference. We can remove the blindfold and use unimpeded hearing. So an analogy might uh, help here. A naive person might claim that Mr. So-and-so winning the lottery was a miracle. The skeptic will re rightly say that sooner or later someone had to win. So there is no miracle. But what if that same guy won the big pot five times in a row? Then a threshold would have been crossed. The winner is either a crooked hardwired or is a crook hardwired to those drawing the winning numbers or he is seriously telepathic coincidence is not an option doing our research we use mathematically effective tools to enable us to focus our attention on those events that are highly non-random 
In other words, such events could not have been sheer coincidence. We can reasonably determine what have, uh, what the chances are that something is coincidental or not. Then we can focus our mental energies on trying to discern what is non-coincidental and Im implying. Some conservative Jews and Christians would say that it is a folly to use these methods, methods of science to probe into the matters of faith. That would seem like a rather defensive attitude for someone in a particular faith to have. If a person truly has strong faith, shouldn't he have the view? Uh, shouldn't he have that view of his beliefs to uphold under any kind of fair investigation? If someone believed in Yahuwah wrote the Bible, shouldn't they also believe that Yahuwah might have written it in ways that would only further support and not undermine this belief? What is needed is the courage to seek the truth, even if that search causes us to modify our original views. Frequently, I was impressed by the unflinching objectivity of the Hebrew expert Nathan Jacoby, Ph.D. As we investigated the possibility of long codes about Yeshua in Isaiah 53, when we first contacted Nathan about the possibility of working with us, we were astonished that he told us he would only be willing to participate if we would devote a significant part of our research to Yeshua codes. Has always been an eager to find out if the Bible codes might prove, provide some clues on a highly controversial question on, on who Yeshua was. After working with us for the past four years, Nathan remains an agnostic. He will admit that there is something real about the phenomenon of Bible codes, but he will also say that it doesn't that he doesn't know what the uh, uh, ultimate implications of the existence of real Bible codes are. This book will, uh, would not have been possible without Nathan's ex extensive partic participation. Without him, our research would have been confined to one and occasionally two word codes. Such codes are seldom improbable. Short codes are everywhere in abundance, even in a Jerusalem phone book. We need to search for the highly improbable long codes comprising of and consisting of multiple sentences to be able to explore reasonable and possibility that some Bible codes might be real. Such sentences had to be grammatically acceptable in Hebrew and a good portion of them need to be uh, needed to say intelligible, plausible things. A Hebrew expert, highly fluent in both biblical and contemporary Hebrew, was in, indispensable. Nathan more than fit the bill. Dr. Jacoby is a Holocaust survivor and was born in France in 1938 of Jewish parents. His parents left him with an anti-Nazi Germany family as they went into hiding when the Nazis invaded France. He was reunited with his parents years, a year later. After the war ended, his parents returned and he moved his family to Israel, where he was educated from 1945 to 1969. Nathan received throughout education in receive a thorough education in both Biblical and Contemporary Hebrew. He received a Ph.D. in Physics from Weizmann Institute of Science in uh, Revaho, Israel, and received a Master's in Science in Physics, Master's of Science in Physics, and a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from uh, Baryan uh, University in Ramat Gan, Israel. Nathan is a retired college professor with more than 30 years of research development in scientific computing and applied physics, aerospace and geophysics. He has taught at atomic and molecular physics, quantum mechanics, college algebra, trigonometry and an analysis, analytic, analytic geometry and calculus. In Israel and in the U.S. in the past several years, Nathan has taught classes introductory and intermediate Hebrew. Retune, excuse me, he retune. He routinely converses with his wife, Ray, in Hebrew, and he reads the news daily in Hebrew from Aharetz websites. His two children live in Israel. And that is the introduction, folks, so we're going to end it right here. And continue this amazing book, Bible Filled Bombshell. You're going to learn a lot from this, folks. We're going to get into Isaiah 53. 
and you're going to see some amazing things that are statistically impossible to happen by chance, which means there is a divine hand that put it there. And if you know what Isaiah 53 is, folks, do I have to say more? I mean, it is a slam dunk. And you can find in one chapter 1,600 different access terms all pointing to the same man as the Messiah. Now, I have to ask you, Penwright, uh, who produces Rabbi Glazerson's videos, uh, End of Darkness. We're talking about a man who denies Yeshua and says Yeshua is a reincarnation of Esau. And he will not go out of the first five books. This same Yeshua is from Genesis to Revelation. This same Yeshua wrote the book, inspired men to write it. So it's not just in the first five books. That is a myth. And I can prove that with other uh, books out of that. And I'm going to do so. Isaiah 53, Ezekiel, uh, Psalm 22. There are many, many books and chapters um, that we can get into that will point to the validity of our Messiah. And so I take, I take, uh, you know, I take offense that Penlight Productions won't touch Code Searcher. Won't touch Chris Ray, but they'll go with a Kabbalist, a mystic. And let me just say, I love that man. He's like a grandfather to me, but he is, he is not, um, he's not seeing the whole picture. He, he still has a veil on his eyes. And Rick, if you knew the Bible, you know that they're going to have. They're going to have the veil on. So he does not know if there's codes past, or he won't accept it now, but there's codes past the first five books. My job is to show him there is. And I've tried to do that very gracefully and with love. Uh, would appreciate your help, but uh, I'm not going to pursue you at it. Uh, I'm just had to say that. So, in the next video, when we. Uh, finish the rest of this book, we're going to dive right into it. I think we might do it live. That way you can interact with me, you can ask questions, we can stop and um, you know, absorb as much as we can on this because I want you to get this, folks. Uh, I'm not passionate about this because this is some trick or some kind of uh, parlor game. It's because he's revealed himself to me in this. On a personal level, the experience has been so life changing that this is my life uh, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe it. Uh, so there you go we're going to get into something amazing and you're going to be blessed you're going to walk away from this uh, with, a, with a new knowledge of what, what we're doing here okay so shalom and enjoy your day tomorrow and I will see you again and we'll get back into this book shalom